Hi, I'm Chase Kojima from Tokyo. I'm Federico from Lumi. This is Taste Dining at Home, presented by Dynast Club. Welcome to the Taste Dining at Home series, presented by Dynast Club. I'm your host for the series, Alice Saslavsky. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm zooming into you from, the Boon people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Today's episode celebrates delicious Japanese flavours paired with some Sapporo beer. So today's topic of conversation is how we can match things to beer, how we can create delicious Japanese flavors at home. Because after all, if you're tuning into this, you're an avid home cook or someone who's just starting out and wants to learn. And we get to do it with some incredible professional chefs. And today's chefs are Chase Kojima from Sokyo at the Star and Federico Zanilato from uh, Leo and Lumi Dining in Sydney. Hello to both of you. Welcome. Welcome to Taste Dining at Home. Now, Chase, I'm going to start with you because yours is the first dish that we see. It's the tuna tataki. And I want to ask yep. you why you chose tuna to work with. Okay. Well, um, again, my heritage and my family, we're all like it, it, with the, the sea. So my grandpa, he's a fisherman in Hokkaido very close to Sapporo and my father he became a like a real like a master sushi chef so mm. I thought sharing today um, definitely has to be fish and then I think the king of fish would be tuna so I thought definitely I want to pair it with tuna beautiful and with, for people who are cooking tuna at home how do you select a really good piece of tuna to cook with I think you need to really identify uh, what color that you're looking for. So I like deep red, like it could be very dark red. That just means it's a very fresh fish. Um, and you know, you can let it sit in the fridge for a couple of days. That shouldn't be an issue. I would probably watch out for if you see a little bit of like a rainbowish color, that's probably something I would avoid. Um, something firm, you know, obviously it shouldn't have any smell. Um, you know, if, if you go to like a fish butchery and then, you know, you, you see like a nice slab. Um, yeah, I, I would ask them, you know, because they would probably know because they have to break it down themselves. Uh, hey, Federico. <laughs> um, I think I think um, there's a lot of factors, but, you know, I would just recommend it by asking the professional there. Mm. And speaking of professional breaking down tuna, the way that you slice that slab and the knife that you use look more like a sword. Uh, <laughs> for people who it are looking to, it is a sword. There you go. Yeah, for people who sword. are looking to improve their knife skills at home, have you got a particular recommendation for a chef's knife or you know where to start? Yeah, I mean, you know, the knife is really important. Um, I'm I'm at a stage where I only want to use really good knives because I, I don't like sharpening sharpening knives all the time. Uh, when you're a young chef, you know, you you sharpen your knife for hours every day. You know, you 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 do that. But you know, at this stage, I'm a bit busier. Um, I want to use something really good and sharp, and it stays sharp. So I would go with um, you know people who that who I know, and I'm still learning all the time about different type of brands. Um, if you want to buy a knife, I totally recommend uh, Knives in Stone. Uh, owner named James, he he does some fantastic knives. The the the, the big sword that I use is from him. Um, um, he he has multiple like he's like the knife nerd, and you know I'm not a knife nerd at all. So I was just ask him. I'm, I want to cut this. I want to cut that. Uh, sometimes I have I want to cut beef. You know he would recommend like okay if you're gonna if you don't want multiple knives, if you want to just stick with one, then, you know, he'll, he'll tell you which one to pick. Uh, and then, you know, it, it doesn't come that cheap, but it's worth it, I think. And um, that's what mm. I would do. Mm. And Federico, speaking of breaking things down, you've chosen a chicken yakitori where you break a chicken down to make it happen. What is your recommendation for people who do want to make this at home, but don't necessarily have your mad internationally renowned chef skills? 
look, I um, I think the best option if you want to do yakitori at home is uh, um, to find a butcher that thinks a bit uh, outside the box because the way that uh, Japanese cuisine uh, all the techniques that they apply on breaking down a chicken is very different from from Western cuisine. They have multiple and a lot of different uh, uh, cuts that uh, we don't use and we don't break it down. We just leave them together. Um, I've seen some chefs in my experience that they come up with uh, 16, 17, 20 different cuts from one chicken. Whereas, you know, as, as, a, as a Western cuisine, we only have chicken thigh, drumstick and, and breast usually <laughs> or wings. Yeah. So there's usually four cuts. So I would either suggest to find a butcher that can uh, break it down for them, or the other option is uh, you watch YouTube videos, uh, yakitori, and you learn how to break it down yourself, which is uh, mm -hmm. a lot of fun. Uh, but you know, it's it's uh, it's a quite interesting uh, skill to learn. Uh, I think you know the the versatility that uh, uh, Japanese cuisine apply to one single bird is incredible. You know, they break mm -hmm. down every single little pieces they all have they all have their own texture their own uh their own flavors you know it's, it's so interesting and i think it's, it's worth the time you know to to do it at home and, and break it on yourself mm. and obviously also, you, it, you started also you get sorry if i interrupt you Alice, it, it, you, you get to you, you get to use every single part of the chicken without throwing anything in the bin Every type of uh, everything, of egg cartilages, knees, uh, very soft bones, skins, uh, neck, uh, they use everything, which is, you know, it's very sustainable. Beautiful. And obviously you have spent a lot of time in European kitchens, but it was in Japan where you really honed your craft. What was it about Japanese cuisine that captured your heart and imagination? Look, I guess it's a, it's a, a lot of different uh, things that really fascinate me and still fascinate me nowadays. It's their, it's their uh, 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 culture that they have for food, their passion that they have for food, uh, the respect that they have for, for the ingredients, uh, the skills that they apply to uh, the technique in the kitchen. Uh, it's just the whole the whole culinary world in Japan. It's it's uh, it's incredible. Mm. And Chase, your father was a chef. You went into the kitchen yourself. What was his advice to you? Was he happy about this, or did he want you to do something boring like be an accountant? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, he was an old school chef, and. Um, I think he wanted me to try it out. Like, I think he wanted to share what he does, you know, his passion. So I was able to help him from an early age, maybe around as early as like nine. But I think like I got into it maybe around 11, like, like, like kind of like after school, every day type thing. Um, he always told me like, Computers is the the next generation, so you know, go go learn computers. What what the f what's computers? Um, and then um, I actually went to computer college, and then um, right before graduating, because uh, I'm in America, 9/11 happened with the terrorist attack, and then I kind of had a, a internship in a in a, a Silicon Valley because it was all close by, but that kind of got uh, like um, dropped and then I wasn't kind of doing anything. This is when I was about 18, I think, <coughs> no, 19. And then my dad's restaurant was super busy. So I was like, okay, maybe I'll just help him like for reals this time. And then I, be I became uh, like a full-time employee there. And then um, that was like, like, like I, I was, I put everything in for that. So that was, yeah, like from 19. Mm. I already had ex and uh, like eight years experience already though, you know? Exactly. And I think that experience really shows. And then you ended up heading up kitchens for Nobu all around the world. Was there a favorite location that you found yourself? Favorite location? Uh, I don't want to say like, because I know everyone's That's very still Japanese. Have, That's very Japanese. Very <laughs> locations, <laughs> but... Um, there's, there's so many good parts about each um 
you know, city that I, I worked in. I think um, I was hoping like they would open one in San Francisco because that's where I was born and I wanted to go back there. Uh, but, you know, like just being able to travel all around the world, like Dubai, uh, London, you know, Bahamas, like multiple other places that I also declined that I want to go to because it's either too cold or too hot or too dangerous. <laughs> um, but yeah, like it was, it was a super good experience. Like just working with so many different people. Um, mm. I learned a lot. Yeah. And obviously settling in Sydney for both of you, um, Federico, you have just opened a new place. You've got Lumi Dining, which I'm sure everyone tuning in has already either been to or has it on their list. But Leo, your new place with Carl Furler, who, um, you know, I, I've had a chance to MC Carl back in the day. And his, the way that he thinks about food, I can only imagine you two together would just be a dynamo. What's that experience been like? Well, um, I gotta start saying that uh, Leo was uh, he, he was born during COVID. Okay, we were supposed to open, you know, uh, just before COVID, and we had uh, we had uh, different plans and and different uh, things in mind. And uh, unfortunately, we we just couldn't open it because uh, we were supposed to open a week before the twenty third, which is the which was the lockdown. Mm. So we had to shut down everything, even before opening we had to uh, change the whole structure the whole concept because uh, uh, we, we had to shut it down for nearly three months and uh, when we when we eventually managed to open it, it wasn't what we had in mind before the city when we when we first opened in june was uh, was still a ghost town was still very very different for for what we were expecting and uh, we had to readjust all our uh, all our concept our ideas that we had in mind it's been great collaborating with a, a, a professional like Carl. Uh, make me grow and and and, and open my mind so much. He's, a, he's an incredible, he's an incredible chef and a very hardworking person. So it's been amazing until now. Unfortunately, you know, uh, the city itself, the CBD is, is is still not the way it used to be before COVID. So we just, you know struggling to find that uh, consistency in terms of numbers uh, and blah 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 we still we, we we're not we will never compromise the product that we put out there but you know when when you don't have consistency numbers it just make it harder for the staff mm -hmm. for the for the suppliers and everything but hopefully we will we will get there mm. so what can we do you know lots of people tuning in are avid fine diners and and diners and foodies that want to support the community and the industry. So what can we do to support you to make sure that Leo is a success? Well, we just need people to come and eat the restaurant, uh, as simple as that. Uh, we don't offer anything else at the moment. We don't have takeaway. We've got a little cafe next to the restaurant, which is, uh, which is quite good. Uh, but again, there's no uh, uh, food traffic around at the moment. Mm -hmm. And we, that cafe relies essentially on on food traffic or people that goes to the office so uh we went down from from expecting to do 50 kilos coffee a week we're doing eight kilo a week now so that mm. is we, we need the food traffic and uh at the little cafe we supply sandwiches croissant uh a little bit of breakfast items and the numbers are very low at the moment so uh ideally we need we just need more people in the cbds that's, that's what we need mm. at the moment. Of course, mm. you know and we can we, we we can adjust always cost cost into the offer that we do. But I think it's just a matter of, of having people back in the offices. Mm. And and you've requested a shout out for a baker. So if there's a baker listening to this <laughs> and wants to join Great. the team, do it, do it. Now, Chase, yes. for you, you you've pivoted as well during. Uh, this year to create a takeaway offering and a delivery offering. Tell us about that. Okay, so when COVID happened um, and, you know, when I first got a call, okay, we're going to all have to close the restaurants. Um, you know, like, uh, I mean, I was a bit shocked, but at, at the same time, I was actually playing tennis with my head chef. <laughs> but um, we we're just like, oh, man, there's more time to play tennis. 
Uh, <laughs> no, that, that's, just, that's just a joke. Uh, we didn't actually play much tennis after that point. But um, basically, I thought, um, man, we're not going to have much things to do, like, especially if, if we don't have any restaurant open and, you know, like as chefs and restaurateurs, well, what are we going to do? Right. So that was, I was thinking maybe, um, I wanted to maybe stream. I wanted to maybe cook at home and let like people watch what I can do. It was more like to, I was thinking of maybe trying to generate money, but it was more also something to do, you know, because if I don't have something to do, I'm going to go crazy. Right. Mm. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I watch everyone watch, like everyone's at home. They can't go out cause we're locked down. So either they're going to be playing video games or watching movies, you know? So then I thought like, you know, video games and, um, video games and, uh, Twitter, like people would, um, stream and, you know, like, I just thought, like, maybe I could do something like that, something really cool, but as a chef. Uh, so then I started building, like, a brand, and I was drawing my face into, like, this robot-looking thing. And then I was thinking of a brand, and then I, 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 was, I came up with a name called Simulation Senpai. Um, senpai is, like, an older brother, uh, like, an elder teammate who kind of, like, supports the younger and I always felt like, you know, I don't, I don't act like a boss at work. I'm, I act more like a senpai, like I'll, I'll support them, you know, like an older brother. Um, and then simulation kind of came up with, because, you know, you want to kind of plan um, how to cook. Like cooking is like all about simulating your plan, you know, like you can't just like walk in and start cooking. You have to have like a plan, you know. So, and then there's a lot of chefs who's, who are, are people who's going to be watching me. They, they probably are not chefs. So. I have to tell them like we need to plan this plan that and you know you, you listen to like all the big names like uh the uh, like bill gates and uh obama like they will always say that we have to simulate these these situations you know like and then they make big calls you know like like so so i thought it was like a planning type of word so simulation senpai was born i was planning to do some uh like youtube videos and streaming like cooking and teaching young kids hey you got to practice how to do this and do that for your for your boyfriends or your wife or whatever you know so i just i was just thinking like this and then i just felt that was only like gonna help me i, I didn't think about i i thought like maybe it's not gonna help my team because you know they're all not doing anything right so i just thought you know um I can sneakily go to the fish market, buy some fish, I'll eat, you know, everyone has to eat. So then I just called up a couple of my staffs and then, hey, let's, let's, um, let's make this. Like, cause, cause I was already cooking for myself. And then I showed it to them, hey, look, can we do this? But we do it at our house and then we maybe deliver. And then, so the first time we actually did it, it was, in, it was inside of Alex's house. Uh, he's like, uh, he's my head sushi chef. Uh, he has a really small house, you know. I don't want to do it at my house because I, uh, I was sharing. <laughs> so I was able to like kind of use my Instagram, kind of promote what we're doing, and then you know pay pay cash or whatever. And then um, and then we did it, and then we were super busy, and we messed up his house. <laughs> we really messed up his house. And then and then I felt all right. We can't deliver because delivery is too hard. Uh, and then I had friends who. Uh, had cafes that were struggling. So I was like, hey, I'll pay you some rent. And let me use your space. So then we started doing it in uh, uh, my ex head chef, Brian's cafe. And we were doing that for maybe a couple months. So uh, we'll do it a couple of days a week. People just come and pick it up. And it was a very success. Uh, and at one point I had like maybe eight, nine chefs helping me. And, you know, it was paying them, it was paying their mortgage uh, or uh, rent and, you know, food on the table. And then after that, I, I just been continuing to do that. And then um, it's been what, a couple of months now and it's doing pretty good, I think. That's awesome. Well, seek out Simulation Senpai if you are looking out for some, it, like, honestly, on Instagram, that looks so delicious. I wish you could send it to Victoria. Ooh. That would make me very happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they should, they should. But it's, <laughs> yeah, it sounds like both of you are doing your best to be adaptable, you know, in a very challenging environment. Um, and I think that the recipes that you chose segue are both quite adaptable as well because they're quite chefy in what you've chosen with the uh, the tataki and the yakitori but 
there are ways that home cooks can do it. You know, um, Federico, you mentioned that a home cook could ask their butcher to chop chop it up finely. Yeah. Um, and obviously the tuna, if you go to a place like foot, fish butchery, they'll give you a nice piece of tuna belly to make your mm, tataki with. Sure. But um, I'm wondering if there are some other hacks that you might have up your sleeve. So Federico, is this a dish that you could make at home on the barbecue without having to slash and slice? You mentioned that you love the thigh of the chicken. Could you like just marinate the chicken thigh in that similar kind of sauce? What was in that sauce again? Absolutely, you can uh, you can easily make it at home on the barbecue. You won't have the same flavor profile than uh, when you when you cook it on the the classic uh, hibachi, because you don't have that uh, that smoke when when the chicken drips the fat and the sauce on the on the hot charcoal. It releases that smoke and the, and the chicken absorbs some of that smoke. You can easily do it uh, at home on the barbecue with a different flavor profile. The sauce is just a simple uh, tari sauce which is uh, basically uh, soy sauce, brown sugar, mirin and sake, cooked down and reduced to the, to the right consistency so that you can brush the chicken and it sticks to the chicken. Because if it's too, if it's too liquid, too watery or too running, it will just uh, run off and all drips on the barbecue. So you need to reduce it down to the, to the right consistency so that you can brush it. Uh, mm. Some people, some people to make it a bit more uh, to give it another layer uh, of depth in the flavor, I like to roast all the carcasses, the one obviously you can't eat. You can roast all the carcasses of the chicken and then steep it in the, in the, infuse it in the, in the sauce, or even wow. reduce down the sauce with the, with the roasted uh, chicken bone. It will add, they will add an extra layer of umami of flavor of, of roasted chicken. Yeah. Now I've got one more question before we hit up the audience questions. Um, obviously, barbecue and beer is a very natural combination. Yeah. But uh, Chase, you know, barbecue uh, or, or beer and, and tuna, really sort of finely seared tuna. What made you think about that combination? Well, you know, like I love eating like, well, I love drinking uh, beer in a especially like at a hot day and you know, sashimi goes really well with the days like that, uh, nice mm -hmm. and cold. But um, with the tuna, like it's so versatile. I think um, obviously you can, I can just serve it raw and it'll still be super delicious with the, the beer. But when you sear it, it just adds another dimension. Like it, it gets a little bit more smoky and it adds more flavor with the, the veggies that it goes with. And I don't know, I just, I just love tuna or I love sashimi going with beer. Mm, yum. Uh, and honestly, if you haven't seen the two dishes, we've got a video on the Taste Dining at Home website. So do check that out because you can make both recipes. The recipes are there. The videos are there. I'm salivating just thinking about the, the licks of, of, um, of grill going onto the tuna sear and onto that yakitori skewer. So ah, yeah. Let's go to audience questions while I gather my thoughts. <laughs> the first question submitted is, what do you both love about Japanese cuisine? Federico, you've answered this question a little bit already. So Chase, we might start with you. Man, I love Japanese cuisine so much. Um, <laughs> I'm Japanese. <laughs> it's hard to not like it, right? Um, I think it's the best cuisine. Um, it, it's, just, it's just perfect for my style. I love how pure and simple it is uh it's refined like like you know even like a simple like federico say a chicken even till now you can probably cut it different or i mean cut it better like there'll be a like there's a way where you can probably refine your skill to cut it better or cook it better and i just feel like it's that endless journey of trying to make it better um and that's how japanese cuisine is to me uh really clean and pure and i don't know just Obviously the flavors and, you know, like the soy sauce and the miso and the fermentation, all of that I love. Um, maybe I love it too much. <laughs> Federico, mm. I'm sure loves it just as much. And do you apply those lessons and learnings to your food at Lumi and Leo as well? Absolutely, absolutely. I think, you know, uh, what, fascinating, what fascinated me about Japanese cuisine and the culture is that, uh, you know, that chefs really master one technique only for all their life. When you go to Japan, you know, you've got people that uh, dedicate their whole life for uh, yakitori 
or, or that they dedicate their whole life for ramen or soba. Everyone specializes in one thing and they master it and they do it as, as, as the best possible way that they can for all their life. And that's, uh, to me, it's, it's a complete dedication, you know, to cooking. Uh, mm. We do try yes, to apply those uh, uh, way of thinking and, and skills to the kitchen, but you know, it's, uh, it's, it's very difficult because uh, uh, Lumi and Leo, we have, a, um, we have a, a degustation menu at Lumi, so chefs, uh, uh, have, they, 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 they need to be a bit more versatile, so they, they have to cook protein, they have to cook fish and meat, they have to do a raw dishes, they have to do vegetarian, they have to do pasta. So you don't, you do not specialize on one thing only. You need to be more, a bit more versatile as a, as a chef. And at Leo, mm. we have a program with the, with the bakery thing. So you need to be able to bake stuff as well. So we can't really focus on one thing as they do it in the pen. I would love to. I think we don't have, we don't have the demand in, in Japan. There's 120 million people and, and restaurants. The biggest restaurant is probably a 15 seats or 20 seats, you know, and uh, they all have tiny little restaurant where they can uh, uh, be very niche. They can have a very niche market. Mm. Mm. And certainly I think through COVID, we've seen some of those little niche, um, you know, even um, chefs, um, chef de party having a little bit more spare time and, and specializing whether it be babka or you know creating their own little little things and i think as as home cooks and as diners we can help to support that by demanding more and and paying you know putting our money where our mouths are and and supporting people that are trying to master what it is that they do and i think that the people tuning in are certainly on that page and really appreciate what you're trying to achieve our next question is um, when stuffing the chicken wings, so we're getting specific now because again, people are, don't, that people are going to do this at home. When stuffing the chicken wing for yakitori, what can you do if you accidentally tear it when taking out the bone? Mm -hmm. oh, that's an interesting one. Look, it depends on the feeling. Because uh, if you tear the skin and you've got a feeling that come out during cooking, then uh, there's not much you can do. If, for example, mm -hmm. you tear the skin and you're stuffing it with a, a muslin, for example, the will they will coagulate during cooking. That's not a problem. I did my stuffing with uh, with uh, rice and chicken, so that might be a problem because the rice, if there's a tear, might come out uh, mm. from the from the from the from the skin. Uh, another option would be to probably poach poach the skin uh, first, so that they can they kind of uh, set first and then grill them grill them after. Is that a cat? This is not a, this is not a chicken. <laughs> Uh, I love that. I love that it's a camouflage. And this is what I actually love about this series is, you know, it's taste dining at home. You get a sense of people's lives. The cat's knocked over the screen. I love it. Let's go to our next there question. That's awesome. Chase, oh. can you use, <laughs> yes. here we go. This is a good question because obviously we've talked about tuna a lot, but there are so many other fish in the sea. So are there yeah. other fish that you can use for the tataki with similar success? Definitely. Um, I think the best second option would be salmon um the only problem with salmon is um it has a lot of sneaky bones in the loin side mm -hmm. so once you sear it it's really hard to uh, pull out so what like even even in my restaurants um i stress a lot when it when it gets to salmon but um after you sear it and after you slice it you really want to go over with your fingers to just make sure there's no bone in there on both sides um, and you can't do that with, with wearing a glove. You really want to just go like, like, you know, touch, touch the flesh with your fingers. Um, because you know, the worst case, um, is leaving a bone in there. Um, also mm -hmm. I think, um, pretty much the exact same dish you could probably do with kingfish also, but making sure that you're using, um, like a size where it's, it, you know, it has like a little bit of depth. So then when you're searing, you don't overcook the fish. Mm -hmm. um, honestly, any fish will work, but just I think the best will be with something that's meaty like that, like salmon and kingfish. Um, if bonito, I was to do, bonito, definitely. Yes, bonito, mm. definitely. 
Um, but yeah, bonito, albacore, that, that type of range, I would definitely say. So. But like simple rule, maybe like bigger fish. Mm. Big fish, yeah. Bigger fish. And yeah, yeah a bigger fish, nice. Mm. Um, mm. Now, the next question, speaking of bigger fish to fry, this is a good one. What uh -oh. do you normally cook when you are at home? Federico, what are you cooking at home? Look, I'm very simple. Uh, I love... <laughs> I love <laughs> That's not cooking. <laughs> vegetable. Vegetable. I try... I'm trying to educate my daughter and my family to uh, have a different approach to vegetables. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not vegetarian, but I, I, I'm kind of reducing uh, the consume of uh, pro animal protein. So uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, anything that is vegetarian and that is vegetable in, mm. in, in, uh, in particular. I have, um, I have a wood fire oven at home, pizza wood fire oven. So I do a lot of pizza and I cook a lot of vegetable in the wood fire oven. Uh, uh, and I just try, you know, to limit the, um, the consumption of, of animal protein, that's all. Mm. And are there any vegetables at the moment that you're particularly loving cooking Ooh. in the wood fire oven? Look, going towards summer, I might sound a bit uh, obvious, tomatoes. Uh, there are uh, a lot of asparagus at the moment. There's great, uh, amazing white, uh, green and purple asparagus around. Mm. Um, uh, we are receiving uh, incredible uh, spring vegetables such as broad beans, peas, sugar snaps at the moment that I have also the menu. So I love those ones, even though there's a, a lot of um, labor required for those stuff. My girls, I have two seven years old girls, they love uh, picking all the, all the peas. Put and them all to stuff. work. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're not big fun. They're not big fun of vegetables. Uh, so that's, uh, it, it, it gets a bit tricky with kids. But mm. we've got we to start mm. from a young age, you know, the, exactly. whole, the, yeah. whole, exactly. the whole concept, you know, of uh, not eating too much animal protein is something that they still don't understand. Uh, but I guess them to start to appreciate vegetable, it's a way to start in you know, that, that process of saying, you know, we can't eat meat, we can't eat animals uh, six days a week, seven days a week forever. Mm. It's not sustainable. Mm. And they also and, you know, if there are any value. So they also have totally. to understand the value value of you know buying meat. Why are we buy meat? Why are we why are we eating meat? You know, mm, which exactly. Is, which and is I think you know, yeah. And if there's any kind of cuisines that really champion vegetables and make them taste delicious, it would be Italian and Japanese. Mm -hmm. So you've got yes. you know, if anyone can make these seven year old girls enjoy mm -hmm. vegetables, I'm sure that it's you. And there's so much yeah. clearly so much love um, in your heart for them. And it very much speaks to my heart. So keep going. And you know, that asparagus at the moment for me, oh, delicious. Yeah. Love it. And Chase, um, what are you doing? And are you turning yourself into a robot before you cook at home <laughs> on a regular I, basis? I, I do like, I don't want to cook too much. I want to record everything, right? No. Um, I think, um, <laughs> I think like for me, when I, when I eat at home, I usually just eat something fermented. So I really like natto. It's a, it's a oh. soybean. Oh. You don't like it? <laughs> oh, it's probably one, 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 one of it's, the only things that I don't like. About it's my favorite, bean, um, oh. especially for my house. So fermented soybeans, uh, I'll mm. crack For someone raw... who hasn't tasted natto, um, what is it, what would you describe the, the flavor and the aroma of natto as? Man, it's just Nothing. really tasty stuff, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, it tastes like meat, honestly. It tastes, it tastes like, it has so much flavor to it. Mm, um, so much amino it's, acid and it's, glutamate. It's, um, well, I put, I put raw egg in there too, to pump it up. But um, wow! Yeah, it's it's to just make, tasty, to make it like... a bit more slimy, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it has a very natural slime to it. Like if you mm. were to chop up okra, you know, it has that yeah. exact similar uh, like mm. stickiness, and you kind of slurp it down with rice. Honestly, I grew up with it. it I love it. Um, it's my go-to food every time. Um, I know it's healthy. It's good for your hair. I don't have hair. Um, but maybe I should eat more natto, maybe. Eh? Dude, you gotta eat natto, man. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then, like miso soup, like just really simple stuff. And then, you know, have like a glass of wine and 
that's it, I guess. Love it. What a, what a brilliant, relatable co combination. And um, if you haven't tried natto, it, you know, give it a go, particularly, um, as you say, I think natto would be quite delicious with some wood-fired vegetables. Federico, that might be the you next thing to try. You probably don't want to warm up the natto. The nat if you warm up not, the natto, yeah, it'll, put it on um, top. It'll, it'll start stinking up your my, house. But, my um, my yeah. experience with natto uh, at the East Akaya when I was in Japan was uh, oh, horrible. I I had a ribbon when I was drunk and I, I couldn't follow it. Oh, you it you know what you should too. do is um, there's a technique. Um, yeah. When you when you mix it with kimchi, yeah, the amino acid like like triples in there too. It, it just Ooh. like like the two bacteria just kind of like marries each other. I don't know. It's having sex in there. It just pumps it up. So it's super good for you. And then when you put like probably like let's say two parts kimchi to one part natto, you're not gonna have that much natto effect. But um, I do the opposite. I do two parts not the one part kimchi. Yeah. And are you making your own kimchi or I'm digressing now, but I want to know, are you making your own kimchi or are you buying it? <laughs> I'm buying it. My dad's making it. <laughs> oh, I love I it. I usually just buy it, yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah. And have you got a favorite brand? Because that's another thing, you know, we're, we're watching this because we want to know what the chefs are buying. There is or are you a going to Koreatown and there. buying it? There's actually, there's actually a, a, a chef who used to own uh, Moon Park. I forgot her name. She has her she has her kimchi out now. Um, yeah, right. You should you should get I, that. It's a, it's a local, I'll it's check a local it out. product. Mm. Great. There you go. There's a tip for you and this is what mm -hmm. the Taste Dining at Home series is all about. Federico and Chase, thank you so much for uh, your time, for your expertise, for your passion for food and knowledge and wisdom and sharing the recipes. Uh, we'll have to cheers with a beer when I finally get to New South Wales. Come by. <laughs> and thank you all for tuning in. You know, uh, um, guys, uh, we'll say goodbye to you both now. Um, all the very best. And, uh, and for everybody that's been tuning in for this episode and for the rest of the series, thank you for watching and thank you for all of your wonderful questions. And please do tune in for the next episode where we'll get to see even more delicious food coming up very, very soon. But for now, make sure that you check out the website, check out the recipes from this episode and from all of the episodes of the series. Thank you to the Taste of Sydney team, to the Taste Dining team, to the Diners Club and to Sapporo for keeping the lights on. Thank you again to both these wonderful chefs and we will see you next time. Cheerio. Bye. Come by, cheers.